Hello, I'm Dr. Henry Nasrallah, Executive Vice President and Scientific Director of the Cures Foundation and Professor of Psychiatry, Neurology, and Neuroscience at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. With me today is Dr. Philip Harvey, Endowed Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Division of Psychology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, who is a nationally recognized and internationally well-known neuropsychologist. The Cures Foundation's mission is education, research, and advocacy for patients and families who are challenged with serious psychiatric brain disorders, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, and anxiety. Now, when dealing with psychiatric illness, we must recognize that in addition to the clinical symptoms like hallucinations, delusions, manic behavior, or depressed mood, several brain, brain functions may be affected. Those key brain functions are called cognition. Now, Dr. Harvey will provide us today with a discussion of various cognitive functions and how they have been found to be impaired in several psychiatric brain disorders, especially schizophrenia. Dr. Harvey, thank you for accepting the invitation of the Cures Foundation to provide our viewers with an informative review of cognitive impairment and its potential treatment in major psychiatric disorders, especially schizophrenia. So let's begin our discussion with a basic definition. What is cognition? Well, cognition is the set of mental processes associated with attending to, understanding, learning, remembering, and using information. When we think about cognitive processes, we usually split them into two groups. One group is uh, what we refer to as crystallized knowledge, which is the sum total of what you've learned over the course of your life. And then there are other processes, which are often referred to as fluid uh, cognitive processes, which are the processes of actually acquiring that information, retrieving it from longer term storage and using it when it's necessary. There are also other cognitive processes that are socially relevant called social cognition, and we'll talk about them uh, separately a little bit later. Okay, so when did we discover uh, in the field of psychiatry and psychology, when did we discover that there are cognitive deficits in schizophrenia? Well, it's very interesting because way back in the 1890s, when Emil Kreplin, uh, a a German psychiatrist defined the concept of schizophrenia, which he called dementia praecox. He also noticed that people with schizophrenia had a whole array of cognitive impairments. Kreplin was an extremely astute observer. And I would say we learned, he saw everything we know about cognition nowadays that you don't measure with an EEG machine or with a computer. Unfortunately, Kreplin's observations sort of fell by the wayside in the middle of the 20th century uh, as treatments for the psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia were developed. Once we had treatments for psychosis, the rest of the syndrome sort of was ignored, and it became a, a disease of delusions and hallucinations rather than a broad-spectrum set of impairment. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I, I know very well how the whole field uh, focused on psychotic symptoms and, and ignored what the Dr. Kraepelin mentioned 100 years ago, which is that these young people have what looks like dementia. Uh, that's why he called them early dementia, dementia precox. Uh, and so why do you think this, this happened? Why did they ignore the basic brain functions and focused only on delusions, hallucinations? Well, there's two probable reasons. One is what we call the law of the tool. You have to remember how horrible schizophrenia was up until the 1950s. There were no treatments. People lived in large institutions. Patients were agitated and draggled. And when we developed a treatment that made the voices go away and made people more amenable to conversing rationally with you, it seemed like a major development. What we didn't understand at the time was that as these people left the state psychiatric hospitals, they didn't go home, get married, go to college and have a normal life. They stayed unemployed and disabled, even though they weren't hallucinating or having delusions. Think about it this way. If you had major cognitive impairments and significant skills deficits, and you were hearing voices, if the voices went away, that wouldn't necessarily lead you to all of a sudden having acquired skills that you never had in the first place. So obviously the, the disability of schizophrenia 
remained even after uh, treatments for delusional hallucinations were introduced. And that's what you're going to talk about today, how cognitive impairment contributes to that. Okay. So, so how do we measure cognition, by the way? How long ago did the did cognitive function start getting measured and uh, what do we do today? Well, it's interesting because contemporaries of Kreplin started the measurement of cognition and Kreplin actually did research on the measurement of cognition in his laboratory. The First World War prompted the in original development of neuropsychological assessments. As many soldiers had experienced projectile wounds in the head and as a consequence had changes in their cognitive abilities. What this did was it led also to a focus on neuropsychology and cognition as a regional brain disorder, because if you got an injury in your frontal lobe, it impacted your judgment. If you got an in injury in your temporal lobe or the medial temporal area, it impacted your memory. How however, we've learned since then that these things are actually mo much more likely to be driven by circuits than by discrete brain regions, but the measurement systematically of cognition uh, began in the early parts of the 20th century. And interestingly enough, some of those early tests are still in use. What are some of the names of those tests that are now commonly used? For example, uh, the domains of cognition that are commonly measured in schizophrenia include processing speed, which is the ability to process information efficiently and rapidly to keep up with a conversation. That those are often measured with the trail making test or with symbol coding tests. Uh, then there are working memory tests, which measure the ability to hold information in mind, such as remembering a phone number, or to manipulate information in mind, such as remembering driving directions while executing the responses. So tests like the letter number sequencing tests or digit span tests measure working memory. And then episodic memory is commonly measured through the use of learning lists of words or stories. So there are story recall tests and word recall tests. The Hopkins verbal learning test or the California verbal learning tests are common list learning tests. And then there are a number of story recall tests that are contained in the Wexler memory scale or in the NYU paragraph recall test, which has largely been used in dementia. Finally, we also tend to measure executive functioning and problem solving. Uh, that's the ability to identify new strategies, to discard strategies that aren't working, to figure out how to navigate a complex situation. We commonly measure those abilities through things like the Wisconsin card sorting test or various kinds of maze learning tests. Great. So, so how long does it take to really comprehensively evaluate cognition in a patient with schizophrenia? And, and are there some brief ones that can be done like within an hour? That's a very important question. The history of neuropsychology, because it was diagnostic, based on the idea of if someone's had a stroke or someone's had a brain injury, we need to find out in detail exactly what they can do and what they can't do, leads to excruciatingly long neuropsych assessments that can take 16 hours. Uh, that's far more information than we need. On the other hand, uh, if you, it's possible to assess important elements of cognition in a very abbreviated manner. Uh, we showed in some research that uh, studies that you participated in, the Katie trial, that uh, you could take a long neuropsychological battery and condense it to 10 minutes of highly informative neuropsych testing. The typical balance nowadays is about 30 minutes or so for most, uh, for most applications. There's an assessment called the brief assessment of cognition and schizophrenia, the BACs that we developed that's quite widely used and now is available in an easily administered uh, tablet-based format. 